So now that uh, Donald Trump has won the U.S. elections mm -hmm. and uh, Brexit has happened in the U.K., um, there are a lot of people, academics, activists, journalists, who claim that neoliberalism is over, that we are entering a post-neoliberal era, that the election of Trump and the success of Theresa May signifies a departure from some kind of globalist neoliberal regime. I mean, do you buy that? Not entirely, no. It depends a little bit how you characterize the neoliberal regime. Mm -hmm. I've always considered it to be a, a, a political project, uh, which is about uh, the increasing centralization and uh, uh, accumulation of uh, more and more power on the part of uh, elites and, and a capitalist class. I don't think that's over at all. Um, I think that's uh, still going on. In fact, that class benefited from the crisis in uh, remarkable ways. And so to me, um, the, the reasons why that class would cease to exercise its power and its influence, uh, I think uh, those reasons uh, haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm, I just uh, don't see it's over. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously there are different expressions of this mm -hmm. and I think that uh, uh, how neoliberalism is being portrayed and justified on the ground, I think the kind of, the, put it this way, I think the, the, the Blair Clinton neoliberalism is, has been seriously challenged at the political level and it may be replaced by an alternative mm -hmm. uh, political or, or it may actually be foundationally challenged, but we'll have to see if that mm -hmm. happens or not. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the reasons given by this post-neoliberalism <laughs> camp, if you will, is that the version of neoliberalism that celebrated free and unconstrained movement of capital, which then was documented and, if you will, codified in treaties like TTIP and TPP and before that NAFTA, is now gone because both Theresa May and Donald Trump have spoken quite loudly against them. And it would be good to know where you think the future of that kind of globalized neoliberalism codified in trade treaties is heading and whether we will see another push <coughs> maybe to get the same agenda but outside of the trade treaties. Well, I think that's already been happening. I mean, uh... I don't think, for example, that the United States, uh, for all of its efforts in helping to create the WTO, likes the WTO. I think the United States has been trying to undermine the WTO for some considerable time. The only reason it uh, is stuck with the WTO, I think, is because of the intellectual property rights issue. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if the WTO is going to work, then why has the United States been going around and cutting deals like CAFTA, uh, the Trans-Pacific you know, Agreement? It's already set up bilateral agreements with Chile and all the rest of it. In other words, it's been engaging in a different trade policy other than that, which is set up by the WTO uh, for some time. And one of the reasons was that the WTO power had a couple of judgments against the United States and the United States didn't like it and, and you know, so uh, the US has been, I think, trying to get out of the WTO obligations, uh, but mm -hmm. it's been doing that for some time. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, you know, you know, Trump and, you know, getting out of the Trans-Pacific and the European thing as being uh, really radically against. Um, I think the, you know, the Trans-Pacific one was uh, specifically, it seems to me, geared to improving the U.S. position uh, in relationship to both the Chinese and European competition. So it was, it was basically an anti-Europe, anti-China strategy for the U.S. to try to consolidate oh. a market territory in which it was uh, hegemonic. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, then the argument was, well, 
to whom are the benefits of that going to flow? Are they going to flow to the American working class? And the answer is no. It's going to flow to uh, American capital. Mm -hmm. So I think that all along, I think there's been skepticism about uh, the new global order that was signaled uh, by those sorts of things. So I, I, I don't see Trump uh, putting aside the negotiation of uh, trade deals with uh, you know, individual countries and so on. I think that will continue. Mm -hmm. One of the big commitments that Trump has announced <coughs> already, and it was a big hallmark of his campaign, was uh, to spend a lot of money in investing on infrastructure. Yes, right. Right. And what does it tell us about the state of capitalism today, where, of course, we know about the dominance of what's known as the fire sector, right, right, the right. finance, insurance, and the real estate, but also what would that mean for ordinary citizens when so much infrastructure will be provided? And Trump has already said that it would be provided that way through public-private partnerships. Yes, right. Well, I, um, I think the uh, investment in, in infrastructure, first off, you know, in the United States, we've had you know, probably about 20 or 30 years of deferred maintenance on major infrastructure. So you travel the New York subway system and it's pretty much a disaster compared to almost any other subway system in the world. So it needs upgrading very, very seriously. And they're having to do it anyway. <clears throat> so uh, I think what Trump is doing is he's, he's promised there's going to be full employment. He's promised there's going to be a lot of growth. Uh, he said he's going to bring jobs back from China and that, but he's not going to be able to do that. So he's going to do the only thing that's possible, which is a vast infrastructural program, which is going to generate a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of income. He's going to boom the economy on the back of an infrastructure investment, which is going to have to be debt financed. Congress you know, has not been allowing debt finance. They didn't allow Obama to do it. Uh, but the big question is, will the Republican Party allow him to do it? And my guess is that half of the Republican Party will allow him to do it. And he'll then turn to the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party will provide him with the votes to do the other part of it. So we'll have an infrastructure, a debt-financed, Keynesian-style infrastructure program of the sort that the Chinese had in, after 2007, 2008, which is going to be a big uh, job creation. Uh, and, and he's going to turn around to everybody and say, and say, say, I told you I was going to be able to boom the economy. Uh, and that's the way he's going to do it. And it's going to, of course, mean mobilizing mm -hmm. interest-bearing capital through the public institutions, and they'll do it through public-private partnerships, or, mm -hmm. you know, which we know what they're about. It's about uh, the private takes all of the profit and the public takes all of the risk. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's what he's going to do. now. The big question I would have, as is true of any infrastructure, is this uh, going to actually increase the productivity of the U.S. economy generally, or is it going to be a bunch of white elephants that uh, are no good for anybody? Mm -hmm. Clearly, in the past, infrastructural investment in the United States, you look at the interstate highway system of the 1960s, had an immense increase in productivity that was associated with that. So you've got to They've got to target the infrastructure well, uh, and, and whether they're going to do that or whether it's going to be, you know, mm -hmm. kind of bridges to nowhere and all that sort of thing is an interesting kind of, kind of, kind of problem. But uh, uh, he's going to be able to turn to the people who elected him and said, I told you I would boom the economy. I've done it on the back of this infrastructure mm -hmm. investment. That's mm -hmm. the main thing over which he has control. Mm -hmm. Uh, he doesn't have control over the global situation you know, and, and global jobs. He's going to offer a deal to U.S. corporations about repatriating profits. And if it's a good enough deal, they'll bring some of it back. But you know, you, then the big question is, are they going to use it to invest? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to use it to you know, buy back their own stock uh, and things like that, which don't generate anything? Mm -hmm. So there's a big question mark as to how that is going. So there are a lot of question marks there. But I think that uh, you know his strategy is very clear, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, I would I would put an odds-on bet that it's going to be fairly successful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of booming the economy at the expense of the environment, mm -hmm. uh, at the expense of uh, you know 
uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of dislocations in cities and so on because you can't renew U.S. Uh, infrastructure without displacing a lot of people and rebuilding mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So we're going to see a lot of that as there was during the period of uh, the 1960s when there was urban renewal, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time was referred to, uh, we shan't use, couldn't, shouldn't re use these words, but it was called Negro renewal at the time, or Negro removal at the time, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is uh, you know, so we'll see some of, some of that going on. He's going to revitalize inner cities, which you say is a disaster, but that means we're going to have, uh, you know, publicly subsidized gentrification of uh, inner cities, and uh, mm -hmm. so derelict spaces will be turned into mm -hmm. livable spaces, but not necessarily for the populations that live there. Mm -hmm. Now, what we know about this model of public-private infrastructure provision, and I think the United Kingdom is probably the mm. leading example, because in London, much of the infrastructure right, is provided right, on that right, model. Right. I think the Oyster card, right. where, you know, you're charged for virtually everything, and you're monitored so that to extract the highest possible value from you, yes. I think it's the paradigm of this yes. model, right? Because yes. that's right. the way in which private yes. investors can actually extract the maximum right. value right. out right. of you. Right. And I'm just curious, would you see the expansion of this kind of Trump-led public-private partnership as a way to also extract more value from oh. us? Oh, sure. Kind of oh, realization of, of value? Yes. As, oh, yes. You know, you talk absolutely, about absolutely. Uh, it's a strategy to, to pull out as much as you can. Mm -hmm. At the point of realization, let the Bangladeshis produce the value and uh, let the Chinese produce the value and we'll extract and appropriate the value at the point of realization. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the general strategy. Mm -hmm. And, and even, even at the level of, you know, things like the Oyster card, you, you were in a position to, uh, you know, manipulate prices in such a way as to extract maximum value from it for mm -hmm. the public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. I think that brings us nicely to sort of the last set of questions that I'd like to ask, and that's specifically about technology. Because in a sense, even if we stick to the Oyster card example, then that is only possible because you have sensors everywhere yes, that monitor right, you right. and they can actually understand where you are, how much you're willing right, to pay and right, so forth. Right. And now that we are here in Barcelona, I mean, Barcelona now is known as the capital of the smart city model, if you will, where there is a smart city expo and a lot of other events connected to the smart yeah, city. Right. But it's also a city where there are a lot of concerns uh, about what's known as the sharing economy, which is not only Uber, but also Airbnb. So Barcelona is one city which has decided to right. take up a battle, let's put it that way, with Airbnb. And that exposes some very interesting contradictions. Mm -hmm in terms of uh, how housing itself, but also you know, real estate, has become a source of welfare for a lot of people who are not necessarily big investors in the Gulf or you know, in London or New York, but who are people of average income in cities like Barcelona, who no longer have a job, but are lucky to have an apartment. And they're turning to platforms like Airbnb mm -hmm. in order to make a little bit of income to compensate for the income from their job, which is just no longer is there. And, you know, any movement that wants to battle a firm like Airbnb immediately runs into opposition from its base, which yes. clearly doesn't want tourism, but also doesn't want to be cut off from right. a source of income, right. which, of course, you know, if you take a historical perspective. It probably all goes back to Margaret Thatcher's promotion of homeownership society right. as a way to cut off the workers from the trade unions and any other organizations. And here you actually see how workers now are cut off even from the cities and municipalities. And I'm just curious if you know of how, what possible strategy a movement or a city that would like to take on this new form of privatized Keynesianism, if you will, can take in order not to lose its base. <laughs> Well, it depends where you're at in the process. I mean, uh, there's no such thing as a good idea uh, which comes from the base with, uh, you know, well-meaning social objectives, doesn't get co-opted and destroyed by uh, capitalists stepping in and organizing it and using it as a source of capital accumulation. It uh, went through this sort of argument in the 1970s when there was this big debate about how positive it was to have flexible specialization 
as a new technology which would allow for you know great more liberty and be very progressive for workers to work with and some of us around said it's not it's not flexible specialization this is going to be turned into flexible accumulation mm -hmm. which of course it was sure. and i don't think there's now a debate of, over that you know so i think airbnb is in that middle stage where it's still kind of about some people trying to get an income where they didn't have an income before. Uh, it's now being organized by capital uh, in such a way as to extract maximum uh, wealth from, again, a realization uh, kind of politics. And at some point or other, people who are on the Airbnb will realize uh, that they've become slaves uh, of uh, the Airbnb capitalistic organization. and. Then they'll get into the questions of how do they organize, like the Uber drivers now mm -hmm. trying to unionize, and all that. are they mm -hmm. employees or are they independent contractors, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's going to be a kind of a transition point. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think that the problem with the municipality right now, or with, with, of trying to regulate uh, Airbnb or trying to sort of curb it, mm -hmm. is that you're intervening at a point where there's still a residual audio, residual. Uh, moment in which uh, many people engaging in Airbnb are uh, looking for it as, as the, the, you know, their, their main source of uh, income for, for a short while. Mm -hmm. So it is a very difficult, uh, but at, th at that point I think it's very important to engage in a kind of political dialogue about you know, where this is he headed and where all the people who are mm -hmm. trying to make a little bit of <clears throat> income out of it uh, they're going to fall under the, the mm -hmm. power um, and a certain kind of monopolistic power, which uh, at some point or other is start to squeeze them mm -hmm. in ways which uh, they're not. They're going to find themselves kind of slaves to the, mm -hmm. the to the to the capitalistic organization, mm -hmm. which says something very important, which is that uh, if people want to continue to 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 engage in this, then they've got to find a way of of, of, of doing it outside of this capitalistic form of, uh, of, of organization and how would they do that uh, is, is a big question. I think the municipality mm -hmm. has to start to cultivate uh, that, that kind of discussion and that kind mm -hmm. of uh, 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 way of uh, way of handling the, the question. But it's a, a tricky mm -hmm. moment in this whole dynamic, although it's moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. I notice that uh, in New York, for example, they're now got legislation Sure. Very much against it because, you know, people were immediately jumping in and renting mm -hmm. apartments and then turning yeah. them to Airbnbs and you know. And also the things. hotel industry is the pushing hotel, very the, much the, the, for that. The whole, so you have yes, the, yes, the hotel industry uh, kind of said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're 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 losing here." So, mm -hmm. um, so f final question: Smart cities, good, bad, ambivalent. Well, look, if a smart city is about, you know, disposing of my sewage more efficiently uh, or sorting my sewage in such a way that it sorts the uh, organic waste from the metallic stuff, and does, if, if that's what it's about, I'm all in favor of that. I mean, and if, if the traffic lights are a bit better and uh, they, things move a bit more smoothly, I'm all in favor of that. But you know the big problems in cities are our problems of social relations and our our problems of uh, meaning and 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 qualities of uh, daily life and experience and I don't see smart cities addressing any of that. Uh, it doesn't address uh, questions of racism in, in in society or or or, or uh, you know the, you know the conditions of. Uh, 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 how to take uh, care of uh, older people, you know, the, uh, the, those, kinds of, those kinds of questions and what, what to do about the fact that um, people are living longer but uh, who's going to take care of them in their old age, you know, when families don't work the way they once did, doesn't address any of the major quality mm -hmm. questions of urban living. So my objection is not that there we, that we have some people around with smart cities and that works things, my objection is twofold. One is that the people providing a lot of the smart city technologies are actually using it mm -hmm. as a means of furthering their own kind of capital accumulation thing. So there's all of that side of it, which I think I would object to. But also I, I object to the fact that somehow or other it's seen as a technological fix to social problems, which don't have technological fixes. They own social problems mm -hmm. have 
have social you know, solutions. And, and it actually uh, ignores entirely and, and fetishizes the, the technological fix mm -hmm. uh, as being the ones that we should be concerned about in, in urban life. And I really object to that very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.